It turned the One Piece logo on its head. Just like Roger wanted to turn the world on its head, you get a spacecraft as well as a three-eyed skull. The reoccurring theme of the frozen giants tells us the secret of immortality behind the enormous frozen straw hat in Orijua. Andrum Island foreshadows what happened during the Void Century, including Usopp's Snow Queen here, that might show Luffy defeating the hidden ruler of the world as well as the strongest devil fruit there is. This is only the tip of the iceberg of the mega theory I'm going to share with you today. Hunting clues to reveal who Emu, the mysterious mastermind behind the story of One Piece, truly is. I'm excited to say that I think this theory is even better than the last one I put out that a few of you seem to have liked. However, these two actually don't contradict each other at all. Much rather, what absolutely blew my mind when I found out is that both smoothly connect as part of one epic mega theory. So just think of this as the best One Piece theory ever, part two. Now, of course, I didn't come up with all of this. The real clue hunter is once again the Japanese god of One Piece theory, Yudoron, who kindly enough gave me green light to share more of his awesome content. I'm gonna be summarizing over 10 of Yudoron's videos in this single one here. We're gonna cover all sorts of evidence here, so please, please remember that neither me nor Yudoron claim that every single detail here is 100% fact. Just make up your own mind about everything you're about to hear, and who knows, maybe you'll come to a completely different conclusion. You might want to get yourself a nice big cup of of coffee for this one. Part 1. Foreshadowing. Factually, there is close to nothing we know about Eam from the story. Just as you, I was completely shocked and honestly confused that Oda seemingly just threw the main antagonist into the story 900 chapters in without mentioning her even one single time. All we really know is that this person sits on the empty throne meant to be held by no one, secretly ruling over the entire world, including the Celestial Dragons and even the Gorosei themselves. So when I first stumbled across this 10 plus video series on Eam, I was genuinely confused and skeptical where you would even get all that material on her character from. But video by video and piece by piece, I could feel my mind being blown over and over and over again. Because as I realized, there has been foreshadowing for Eam throughout the story as early as Sura Village even. Which in retrospect makes a lot of sense because Oda has planned his ending right from the start. Now there are countless possible routes we could start the theory from. But I think to have a solid foundation to build on, the best one is starting with all the foreshadowing and symbolism for Eam. These are the two katakana characters to spell E. And there are two very common theories in Japan when it comes to the inspiration for her character. The central wordplay here is 16, E Mu. And when you take the two letters together, they form the kanji character for Buddha. Now based on this, some people have speculated that this is a reference to friends, which in Japanese is spelled as Buddha country, for whatever reason I guess. So this might very well be a nod to the French Revolution and especially to the rule of Louis XIV, Louis the 16th. And indeed, as I explained in my analysis of Trafalgar D. Waterloo Law, the French Revolution and the events surrounding it are without any doubt inspiration for parts of the plot and might very well hint at the past or future of Eames' reign. The other alternative is going back to the Buddha itself. Here, the number 16 is considered as a holy number, that in One Piece is referenced, for instance, in Luffy ringing the bell at Marineford 16 times, or Doflamingo's strongest attack. <laughs> In general, there are two Buddha-like characters in One Piece. There is Sengoku, who literally ate the Buddha fruit, and the second Buddha in the story, any guesses, is no one else than good old Tonoyasu from Wano, who is seen as a Buddha by the people of Ebisu Town. Now, how do these two characters connect? Both of them are of course former military leaders, and both of them share the symbol of the maple leaf. Sengoku wearing a shirt with them on it, and Yasu explicitly being said to have loved maple landscapes. And so the first major clue in our chase after Eam, I guarantee will already surprise you. It's none other than the world's most badass grandma, 
Dr. Kureha, whose name literally means maple leaves. <laughs> As you'll remember from my interview with Yudoron, Oda writes One Piece according to the principle two sides of the same coin, mirroring, twisting, and inverting many elements in the story in two places. So based on that idea, many characters Oda has introduced at certain points in the story serve as foreshadowing to Eames' true identity. And so we'll also be looking at people like Enel, Pudding, Doflamingo, and even Robin. Especially Robin. Now, if Skypea is the key for Joy Boy and the Ancient Kingdom, as I explained in part 1, Drum Island might be the most important one when it comes to Eam and the secrets surrounding her. And Dr. Kureha is the one that has the closest connection here. Her name not only connects her to Eam's name through the Buddha, but the wordplay for the chapter in which Eam makes her big appearance, 908, is Kureha, Kureha. Her disciple Chopper is a reindeer, which in Japanese is called Junroku. Jun Roku 16. And the volume in which we get to know about the two is volume 16 as well. Kureha, coincidentally, is also the one who first introduces us to the idea of inherited will and the will of D, as well as revealing Roger's true name to be Goldi Roger. D. Here, we also first learn about Blackbeard and about Marie Joa, where we literally see the very first reverie taking place before meeting Eam during the second one. Chopper also plays an important role here, of course. The deer and the maple leaf, by the way, are a strong playing card in the Japanese game Hanafuda. Now, the big theme of Drum Island is, of course, medicine. Chopper, of course, also wants to create a panacea. <laughs> This is because all doctors in the country have been monopolized by Wapol to control the population before being chased away by Blackbeard. Now, however, Kureha sits in his empty castle at the top of a high mountain overlooking the rest of the people. Does this remind you of anything? As you've just figured out, this castle and Pangaea castle on top of the red line are two sides of the same coin. Here, Imsama is the one who sits in the empty throne. And so the idea here is that Kureha represents certain traits of Im as well, something to do with medicine. Dressrosa, which also served as a miniature of the world at large, just like Drum Island, has a ruler that monopolizes healing abilities. Doflamingo's capture of Princess Moncherie. Dofi and Wapol, a former celestial dragon and an aspiring one. Oh, and by the way, an important theme throughout this video is that Dofi and his crew all represent certain traits of Eam as well in some way or form. Huh? Now, Drum Island is also inspired by Canada. The small town here, for example, is modeled after the Canadian city Banff, is how I think think you pronounce that? Canada being of course connected to maple and also maple syrup. And sweets will also be very relevant later on as you'll see. For Dofi's crew, the connection here is sugar. Not only does she wear a hood and a crown similar to Imu, but her abilities allow her to erase memories, just as happened during the Void Century. And both Kureha and Sugar are women way older than they look. Sugar being a 22-year-old in the body of a kid, and Kureha being a striking 140, but still going strong. See where I'm going with this? If these two characters are connected to Emu, that would mean that she is also a woman with an unusually long lifespan. How long? How about eternal lifelong? One thing that always confused me was the fact that the 20 kings, just like the 20 doctors on Drum Island by the way, chose to abandon their kingdoms and move to Marijo. I'm sure they all had all the luxuries that they could ever wish for there already, and they even had to give up their power over their nations to new royal families. What exactly is it then that Emu could have offered a king that they didn't already have? Exactly. I think one of the reasons that Emu was staring so intently at Vivi was due to the fact that she could not comprehend how her ancestors could have passed on the opportunity to gain immortality. I mean, just look at Cobra, the king of Alabasta, and how radically he has aged over the course of just two years. Compare that with the Gorosei, who appear to haven't aged a day since we saw them 22 years ago on Ohara. 
the contrast here almost feels deliberate. The first time the Gorosei are introduced is chapter 233. The wordplay here is Jin Mirai Sai, a Buddhist term meaning as much as until the crack of doom or till the end of time. Imu's first chapter, 906, is Ku on no Risu, the ideal of eternity. To me, the reality seems to be that in the world of One Piece, immortality has already been achieved. Don't you also find it suspicious, for instance, that the world nobles who love hoarding powerful fruits and abilities had no problem with Law joining the warlords? That they apparently didn't care for his ability to perform the immortality surgery? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I feel like they would definitely try to monopolize and reuse this ability for themselves. Instead, the person desperate for this ability is none other than Dofi, a former celestial dragon who got taken to Earth by his father and denied re entry by the other world nobles. If he was living a life of promised immortality up on Morijoa, wouldn't it make all the sense in the world that he would resent his father for taking that away and that he would want his birthright back? To live forever. So, is the national treasure of Marijoa literally an extended lifespan for its citizens? The other national treasure we know of is that on Fishman Island, coincidentally located directly under the castle at the bottom of the sea, two sides of the same coin. The box on Fishman Island contained a drug that took away lifespan for more power. So, wouldn't it make sense if the national treasure of Marijoa granted more lifespan in exchange for literally less power of the nobles, giving up control and submitting to one ruler. The parallels between Drum Island, Fishman Island, and Marijoa don't end here though. Two characters that mirror each other as well are Nami and Shirahoshi. You might remember that as well from my interview with Yudoron. They have the same look, including the same overproportional boobs. Their mothers share very similar personalities and deaths. Both were oppressed by Fishman and both locked up for their abilities. Sanji even calls Nami a mermaid princess in chapter 6. <laughs> and on Drum Island, we see Luffy climbing the walls of the castle on the mountain, just like Fisher Tiger did, to save Nami's life. So could it be that he will do the same thing again for Shirahoshi, fulfilling his and Joy Boy's promise to bring her and the fishmen up to the surface? The other big clue is the suits of the Celestial Dragons. Yes, they do look like spacesuits, and I do want to talk about that in just a second as well. What I want to focus on right now, however, is the bubble that they wear whenever leaving their residencies. Is it really only a symbol of not wanting to breathe the same air as the peasants down below? I mean, they don't seem that uneducated to actually believe that. Well, except Charles, maybe. But Mjolsgaard is not insulted when he loses his helmet on Fisherman Island. He looks genuinely scared to me. So what if the Celestial Dragons actually carry around air from Arisia with them, not because they need to rub it into everyone's face that they're not part of the Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. but because the air gives them immortality? Mjolsgaard even has a beard when we meet him again, suggesting that he aged somewhat during his time with the Fishmen. He even says that Otohime made him human. And and another thing we know makes Fishman Island special is that it is illuminated despite being at the bottom of the ocean by the roots of the mother tree Eve. And so, the idea that the top of Eve goes through the red line and up into Marijoa is not exactly new. We also know that Eve is related to the trees on Sabaody that create these bubbles that can be used to coat ships. Funnily enough, this is done by none other than Rayleigh, someone who knows the true history. So, if Eve reaches all the way from the bottom of the sea to the top of the red line, that would mean that there could be a bubble held in place underground on top of its leaves, creating an artificial space similar to Fishman Island at the bottom, that allows the celestial dragons to extend their lives, having to bring small bubbles of it wherever they go to not lose the air's effect. 
Now, there are no clues to whether it's the tree itself that could create this effect, or whether it just serves as a container. If it did have the effects of immortality, however, that would mean that Eam, just like Wapol, holds the monopoly of immortality in the world by enclosing Eve into stone under Marijo. So, just like Dr. Hero looks, cherry blossoms could heal the hearts of the people of Drum Island, could Eve cure the actual bodies of those on Marijo? Well, Seng Goku and Tonoyasu's hair do the exact same thing as well. And as we know, cutting down trees is a quite common theme in the story. Noland cutting down the holy trees of the Shindorans to save their lives, cutting down the giant jack to defeat Enel, the literal tree of knowledge being cut down on Ohara, and Chopper's name literally coming from chopping down a tree. And so if the Straw Hats had to cut down the Eve tree to end the immortality of Emu and the Celestial Dragons, wouldn't that also fulfill the prophecy, destroying Fishman Island in the process? Wow, this is a really long theory. Let me take a quick break. Whoa, 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 whoa. No time for breaks. I'm gonna take over for you right now. Oh, also you should subscribe. Yeah, you should make sure yeah, to- Yeah, Get the hell out of here. Part 2. Eam's origin and history. Okay, so first, the giant Jack and NL. We've already talked about how important Skypiea was as an arc in the last video. And so of course, NL declaring himself God and being taken down by Luffy, the natural enemy of gods, makes it really easy for me to form a connection between NL and Eam. Again, two sides of the same coin. So here, instead of Eve, we have the giant Jack, and instead of Marijoa, we have the holy land of gods. You get the idea. NL is a fake god without wings, ruling over the sky people and traveling up to the moon to God's realm. So if we invert this, does this mean that Eam is a real god with wings ruling over fake gods after coming down from the moon from God's realm? Yep, but it's not quite what you think. A likely inspiration for Eam is the story of Princess Kaguya. If you watched Naruto, you're probably already familiar with this. But if your first reaction to this was the same as mine, ah oh damn, now they're gonna ruin One Piece the same way as Naruto. No worries. It actually makes way more sense here. You already correctly guessed that Eam resembles Kaguya a lot. The five nobles might very well represent the Gorosei. Bamboo is also represented by Virgo in the Don Quixote Pirates. We even have the potion of immortality thrown in there. Kaguya returned to the moon, handed over the potion of immortality and got her memories erased. So inverting that, Eam came from the moon, took immortality for herself and erased everyone else's memories. The feathered cloak of course also connects us to Doflamingo, who literally has no compassion for others. His birdcage might then be a metaphor for Eam's control of the world, or maybe even the moon, which might be an ancient weapon used to create floods. However, as we will see, Eam is not an actual citizen of the moon, as they prepare an army to fight against whoever invaded them, and given that their descendants fought with the ancient kingdom against the enemy, they most likely were Eam's enemies as well. So if not one of the sky people, who then is Emu? Let's return now to the idea that the celestial dragons are actually wearing spacesuits. Those suits, as well as the hoof of the dragon, are the main two symbols that we associate with the world nobles. Now, this may sound very weird, but I'm gonna show you a fresco from a monastery in Kosovo, which is actually a world heritage site. In the middle here, we see Jesus, and on the top right, there is this guy here. Now, this was painted in the 14th century, and I guess it won't surprise you to find out that many have taken this to be the depiction of a spaceship by the unknown artist. Now, what interests us here, however, is whether Oda might have taken the symbol as inspiration, making Eam someone who came to Earth from somewhere else. Because if you take this symbol and turn it by 90 degrees, you perfectly get the symbol of the celestial dragons. And another interesting detail I noticed as well when looking at this was the sphere with the eight orbs surrounding it that we know from Alabasta, Wano, and Shadora. Whoa, but is Oda even into aliens? Well, let me take a look at the first volume of One Piece and... Oh! So uh, let's go down the alien route a little bit more then. I mean, 
there are space pirates after all. Oda also mentioned in the author's note of volume 96 that when you turn 96 on its head, you don't get 69. Uh. And the uh, idea of turning things on its head are a pretty fundamental concept in One Piece. <laughs> Now, this seems to be related to the story in the manga, but could it be that Oda is telling us to turn the literal manga on its head? Well, let's try. Hmm. So, I think it doesn't take too much fantasy to see the straw hat as a flying sorcerer here, with the moon above it. However, what is really interesting, I think, is that the skull suddenly also becomes a new face. The nose flipped on its head becomes a face with two eyes and a third eye on top of it. Hmm, well where have we seen that before? The mouth of the skull then turns into this elongated head. But that would be ridiculous, who would have a head like... Oh right, the symbol of the literal space pirates that we saw, as well as Fukuro Kujo in Wano. Nimu also has this elongated shape. So could her and Fukuro Kujo be of the same race? The three-eyed tribe that we now know exists thanks to Pudding's introduction. Hmm, but then Fukuro Kujo would also need to have a third eye, and he clearly doesn't. Or does he? Look at this patch of skin on his forehead. This looks very suspiciously like it could be an eye. And we actually don't know what his other eyelids look like since conveniently he's wearing sunglasses. Also to hide the fact that he has the same ringed eyes as Imu. Ooh, why is there a mosquito? He even has this large wrinkle when he's depicted as a young man. And if Fukuro Kujo gets longer and longer with age, wouldn't that mean that Imu would have had a long time to get really long with age as well? Which would also connect Enel to this, who has the same Buddha-like earlobes. Now, we already know that the Three-Eyed Tribe is said to have unique abilities. Shiva, the supreme god of Hinduism, also has a third eye, and it can also be seen on many Buddha statues. And even in the West, there is the famous Eye of Providence, which represents the all-seeing Eye of God. And in the world of One Piece, this third eye seems to be able to decipher the Poneglyphs. Pudding is only half third eye, but when the third eye is truly awakened, does it have the ability to see anything, like clairvoyance? And speaking of clairvoyance, that would fit perfectly with Viola's ability as one of the members of the Don Quixote Pirates. Now Viola appeared to Sanji sitting on a chair, again summoning the image of Imu on her throne. Mihawk, who also has Im's eyes, also appears the first time sitting on a chair. And funnily enough, the same is true for Pudding, who we also meet sitting in a chair. The same is true for Hancock, who teaches us about the mark of the Celestial Dragons, and who's able to turn people into stone. The stone is actually another symbol closely linked to Imu. In chapter 877, we see how Pedro blows himself up. Again, two sides of the same coin, with Dr. Hero Look's death on Drum Islands. The wordplay for this chapter is banana. Banana. So, what does a banana have to do with stone? You'll like this one. There is a very common type of myth in Asia called banana type myths, which, let's be real for a second, is the best name of anything ever. Now they're all a bit different depending on the region, but all these tales follow the same pattern. A god presents a stone and a banana to a person. The person chooses the banana, cause at least he can eat the banana. <laughs> However, the changeless stone is a symbol for immortality, so if the person had chosen the stone, they would have become immortal. By choosing the banana, however, that rots fast, they choose a short and mortal life. Now, if Im represents the godly and immortal stone, who could represent the human and fast-lived banana in one piece? Exactly. Kaido. Huh? Just kidding, it's Monkey D. Dragon and Monkey D. Luffy, the two main threats to Eames' rule. And now what is really interesting is that in the Japanese version of this myth, the banana is replaced with a flower. And that brings me to probably the most interesting connection to Eames-sama of them all. Nico Robin, user of the flower fruit. <laughs> Robin and Imu are, you guessed it, two sides of the same coin. Imu is 1-6, while Robin is 6-1. Robin's hometown Ohara, which has disappeared from the world map, is the exact opposite of the world center, the sacred city of Marijor. 
On Ohara, there is the Tree of Knowledge, while on Marijua, there is Eve, who got cast out of paradise for eating from said Tree of Knowledge. Robin's protector is Dr. Clover, who is directly connected to the Gorosei, who protect Emu. And look at chapter 237, where Robin literally uses a third eye. Robin has the flower fruit, while Emu is seen in her flower garden in Pangea Castle. And Robin might actually also be the greatest hint at Eam's backstory. She is the devil child. So reversing that, Eam sama could be seen as the child of God. While Robin was feared and hated for her abilities, Emu might have been valued and cherished for hers. However, maybe just like Robin, people will have tried to exploit her for it anyways. Another great parallel is how Big Mom used to hate Pudding and treat her just like Robin was treated until she found out about the Three-Eyed Powers when she suddenly became Big Mom's favorite. But she still was exploited anyway. <laughs> Remember what Saul shouted to Robin through the fires of her burning home? <laughs> he says Robin will not be alone forever. So. Emu has probably been alone forever. As far as we know, only the Gorosei even know of her existence. A person ruling in secret from a throne that is not even supposed to exist. And actually, let's stick with Saul here for a moment and look at the symbol of the frozen giants. Because his introduction to the story was very interesting to me in many ways. A giant with the will of D, Saul is a reference to the devoted Jew Saul, who one day was blinded by a heavenly light and and saw a sign from Jesus, upon which he converted to Christianity and became Paul. Similar to this, Saul converted away from the celestial dragons to help the people of Ohara. An interesting detail here, in English we know him as Jaguar D. Saul, however Jaguar is not his name in Japanese. Not even close. It's actually Haguaru. Haguaru d hugging the world, which makes sense to me because he's the one who tells Robin that there are also many gentle giants as well. Nice time. Now, what connects Robin and her frozen giant to Emu then? You guessed it, the giant frozen hat deep under Marijoa. Could this straw hat belong to Salt's ancestor? A good giant with the name of D and a straw hat? And what if I told you that we've already seen that in the story? Another frozen giant is Ors on Thriller Bark, and he literally takes on Luffy's personality when Moria puts his shadow in him. <laughs> Luffy, but a giant. That's the symbol of the person who wore that giant straw hat, which is why we see Luffy smiling at us when Emu enters the room. Now, the big question of course is, why did Emu keep it? Shouldn't the D who wore it be the natural enemy of her? Again, it's Robin that I think might give us the decisive clue here. Robin's defining character moment of course is this. <laughs> So what's the inversion of this for Emu? I wanna die? Actually no. What is probably the case here is that the inversion of I want to live is actually I have to live. Emu is immortal, or more specifically, not allowed to die. While she can grant the celestial dragons immortality, she herself might have gotten hers in a different way. You've probably already stumbled across the idea that Emu had the immortality surgery performed on her. Well, what if the person who did that was none other than our giant version of Luffy 800 years ago? And the reason why Emu keeps that straw hat is because it belongs to the person who saved her life. Just like Robin was saved by her giant and later by her straw hat. The title of chapter 397, where Saul saves Robin, is to reach the future. Not only Robin, but also Emu. And the other big clue that Emu had the immortality surgery performed on her is chapter 660. Here, once again, we have the symbol of the frozen giants on Punk Hazard. The title of this chapter is The Royal Shichibukai Trafalgar Law. This is where the symbol of the frozen giant and the OP OP no Mi come together. The wordplay for this chapter is Ro Rume, Law, Room, as well as Memory. <laughs> <laughs> 
Which is funny, you know, because memory is symbolized in One Piece by the falling of snow. Snow, by the way, represented by Monet, Sugar's older sister. And this will be our clue to find out what happened that caused the Void Century, a period between 800 and 900 years ago that cannot be told about, that has been erased from memory, and where any research is forbidden by the penalty of death. This is exactly what happened to Ohara after finding out that a huge kingdom was destroyed during these 100 years. The motive here is most likely the French 100 year war. Remember from the start of this video? Like, 10 hours ago, it was a civil war fought by the French lords around 1400, and it was a war of territorial disputes. The French Revolution broke out 400 years later, and it is referenced a lot in One Piece, as I explained in my law video. But how exactly do you erase 100 years of history from the world without killing every single person? This is how Emu did it. Okay, finally we can talk about Usopp and his Snow Queen. <laughs> Luffy snowman, by the way, with a cape, three eyes, and a long hat. In this episode, Snowfall appears for the first time. When the ship suddenly changes directions, Luffy asks Nami if she forgot something. And after all the chaos is over, Zoro wakes up not remembering a thing of what has happened. Of course, we have all the Snowfall on Drum Island, which represents Emu as well as Hirolok's memories. Hirolok's last words being... <laughs> Then we have ash falling like snow in memory of the Burning Mary. We have another winter island with Punk Hazard, an island forgotten by the world and filled with the memories of Vegapunk. And we have of course Ringo region in Wano, which is also filled with memories for Zoro and Hiori. Notice how the snowfall also goes hand in hand with destruction. The snowman, Dr. Hero look, the Mary, the island of Punk Hazard, Wano. The most interesting case of snow, however, is probably during Whole Cake Islands. According to Euteron, chapter 900 might represent 900 years ago and the start of the Void Century. Cannonballs falling like snow. Could Big Mom's musical tell the story of the destruction of the ancient kingdom on Jaya? Chapter 901, even if you die, don't die, represents the swallowing of Laugh Tail by a whale and its escape. Basically, how Laugh Tail probably vanished from Jaya. You know, like the little island inside Laboon that Crocus lives on. Then, chapter 902, End Roll, is the end of the war and the erasure of memories. The wordplay here is for eternity. In it, we see Pudding falling in love with Sanji and kissing him, but not having the courage to let him know. So she cut out his memories using her powers. Pudding, also a member of the Three-Eyed Tribe, of course representing Emu here, and how she took away the world's memories to create the Void Century. And will you look at this? Coincidentally, it is snowing cotton candy in this episode. Chapter 903 is Luffy becoming an Emperor of the Sea, the sea being Umi in Japanese. Luffy, the Emperor of Umi and Enemy of the Gods, versus the godly Emperor Emu. Now, the image of the Snow Queen is most likely related to the story of Hans Christian Andersen, which actually has surprisingly little to do with the Disney version. Let it go. Basically, there is an evil troll that creates a distorting mirror. A piece of that mirror gets stuck into the heart of a boy, so his personality changes drastically and he is taken away by the Snow Queen. His friend, Gerda, sets out to find the boy and heals his distorted heart with her love and tears, all taking place under the beautiful northern lights. The important things to take away from the story that clearly inspired Oda are snow, memory, the queen, light, and the mirror. And in chapter 902, which represents the erasure of memories, not only did Big Mom, the queen, putting the memories and snow appear, but also Brulee the mirror. Also, we have Dr. Koreha again as the Snow Queen in her icy castle. And there even appears a talking reindeer in that story as well. <laughs> Another surprising character connected to mirrors, light, and memories is Jungle, who is on the cover of chapter 145, where Hero Look says that people only die when they're forgotten and blowing himself up. There is a literal mirror ball and light. And Jungo first appears way back in Sarah Village in chapter 25, which is titled 800 Lies for no apparent reason whatsoever. One, two, Jungo! 
In other words, I believe that the way that Imsama and the other celestial dragons manipulated memories and created the 100 year gap 800 years ago was by covering the sky of the entire world in white, then emitting a strong light and using the reflection of that light to manipulate people's memories. Just as the strong light in the story of Princess Kaguya, after which she lost her memories. We can even see that represented at Marineford as well. Sengoku, the Buddha, Aokiji, the Snow, Kizaru, the Light, and Akainu, the Red Line. Now, the wordplay for the Japanese phrase for the Void Century is 989. So, looking at 989, what might represent the Void Century here? The answer is Frankie, or to be more precise, his radical beam. Unlike the times we've seen it before, it explicitly takes the shape of a snowflake here. And the first time light in general was referenced in a title was in chapter 850, where we see Smoker and a snake in the snow. And coincidentally, it's also the same chapter that Pudding reveals her third eye and true intentions for the first time. Emu used snow and light and some unknown power to erase the memory of the world, and thus created the void century, now only remembered in the inscription of the Poneglyphs. Part 3. Emu's Devil Fruit Now, the last riddle to solve is the question, what makes Emu so powerful that she can rule the entire world next to her three eyed powers? Does she have a devil fruit? Yes. Yes, she does. And what an awesome devil fruit it is as well. In fact, it does have something to do with water, but it's not what you think it is. It's actually a mythical zone devil fruit. The initial hint we get for this is actually the Alabasta Saga. It's the parallel arc to Dressrosa, and so it was no big surprise to me that it also had something to do with this. The saga is of course about Crocodile trying to steal the country and acquire the ancient weapon Pluton by depriving the entire country of its water supply. The purpose of the Baroque Works organization is to realize an ideal world, and just like no one knows about Emu, no one knows the real identity of Mr. Zero, aka Crocodile. Spoiler alert. Crocodile's weakness is water, so if we invert this, it makes water Eames strength. Chapter 212, when natural rain finally falls again on Alabasta, also has this octopus on its cover, sitting on a chair with three eyes open. The same pose as Nami on the cover of volume 11. Nami, who incidentally was called a witch in the Arlong Park arc, who controls the weather, just like Eam might be able to control the weather as well. However, the idea of controlling water is not only limited to Alabasta. Fishman Island, the opposite of Marijoa, has the martial art Fishman Karate that allows the control of water, currents, and even moisture in the air. So Emo's ability being very powerful, it's likely that she's able to control any form of water, including that in the air or even in the body of living things, perhaps making it possible for her to grant immortality. As you know, there are weaker and stronger versions of certain devil fruits out there. Eam's fruit then would be the most powerful version of Monet's snow fruit and even Aokiji's ice fruit. Because if you can control the moisture in the air, you can also freeze things. And you can of course also create storms and other weather patterns. The most powerful fruit in the world. The concepts of water and rain are closely tied to her character. Emu in reverse means umi. Eames number 16 is also the wordplay for the word rain. Amen. The wordplay for water, Mizu, is chapter 32. And in chapter 32, we see Momo's dragon on the cover, and the title is Great Disaster. And since Ame coincidentally also means candy in Japanese, we have the link again to sugar and the entire Whole Cake Island plot. Rain, similar to snow, almost always has a destructive symbolism in One Piece. Diamante rains thorns and iron. Also, there is Doflamingo's white waves. We have Shirio of the Rain, the bombardment of Ennis Lobby being compared to rain, and of course our all favorite evening shower Conjuro. <laughs> There are also endless chapters that have various wordplays relating to Emu that have to do with water. No worries, I'm not gonna bore you with all of them now. The real question I want to know about is what is the corresponding chapter to Emu herself? Probably chapter 16, which is a chapter about Buggy's crew? Oh damn. Maybe the wordplays actually don't work at all after all. Only that in the story we of course don't talk about Emu, but Emu-sama. And Emu-sama is 163. And chapter 163 has it all. 
a big full moon in clear sides, Luffy wanting water, Vivi the queen hiding herself and her foreheads, Cobra stating that the weather is God's work, and of course Arubana, which has Hana flower in it as well. The second chapter that fits is 56, where we first hear about the All Blue and that features the notorious Panda Man. Oda's backstory for Panda Man is that he is a demon superhero who resolved to become strong because when he told everyone that he saw Princess Kaguya, they didn't believe him. Rings a bell, right? And for chapter 563, we have Chopper eating cotton candy with some birds. Cotton candy in Japanese being Watame rain again. And as you can see, we have gone full circle back to Chopper and the birds are actually important as well. Notice how many of the characters that embody Emu have a bird theme? Robin, Monet, the snowbird on Drum Island that was linked to Marijoa, Hawkeye, Doflamingo, you get the idea. So we have the symbol of the bird, of water, and of the third eye. And there is one mythological creature that unites all of these features. It is associated with eternal youth, femininity, Buddhism, the third eye in Hinduism, water manipulation, has wings, dances like the dance powder, and it's often compared to gods or angels. Just like Chopper has a human model devil fruit and Sengoku has one, Emu has the human human fruit fruit model Apsis, the celestial water nymph. If you want to fully understand how this crazy theory came together, you have to watch my interview with the theory master Euteron himself right here. Thank you very much.